thought there was more. <laughs> Oops, there we go. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than all that we can ask for or imagine, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, would you open to Ephesians chapter 4 and also hold your place in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. Let's begin with prayer and then we'll uh, get right into this lesson. Let's pray. Holy and Righteous Father, we thank you for this gathering and for this time where we can um, show our affections to you, that we can offer up to you worship and, and uh, praise you, Father, and adore you. And Father, we're thankful for your presence here with us today as we uh, sing songs and as we pray and as we consider your word, Father, we know that you are near and that your presence is with us and it's good for us to be here. Father, we thank you for your word, for your Holy Spirit that has inspired your word that we might know what your will for us is, that we might be able to uh, grow in, in faith and in love and in grace and in maturity by examining your word and by putting it into practice in our lives in ways that will uh, glorify you and will increase your reign here and forever. And so, Father, we ask that you would be with us and give us courage and boldness as we, as we try to live out our, our faith and try to serve you. Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you give to us and for this fellowship that we have together through your Son. And we ask that you be with us now as we study together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have a whole bunch of people traveling back today. We should make sure we pray for them. I already prayed for them earlier today. Uh, Jane and I did a little math. I, I, somewhere about 50 people are traveling back today. We had a whole bunch of people that are gone. and uh, So we just want to make sure that they all safely return and get back together with us. We're Looking forward to seeing them, but it's good for us to be here. Yes? yes. Amen. It's good for us to be here. Uh, I won't make a big deal of this, um, but I do like to give a quick update when I can on Jacob. And uh, part of what we've experienced this week is conflicting news. We had a PET scan that showed that he still had cancer, so they sent us in for biopsies. They did a needle biopsy. Uh, he was a, a champ. They uh, put a needle in his back and through his rib cage and to his rib and. Uh, they said he didn't even flinch, right? He's a tough kid, just like his mom. And uh, so uh, they took five needle biopsies, and it came back negative for cancer, no cancer. So the, the, no, no, don't get excited yet. Don't excited. The doctor doesn't believe it. Uh, he says uh, there's just too much on the PET scan to show that we need to do some more uh, research. So we are talking to a surgeon tomorrow. They're going to remove one of the tumors, the largest of the tumors, on his lung. And they're going to examine the entire tumor. Now, what we're praying for is that this biopsy is correct and that there is now no remaining cancer, that there are just dead cells and tissue that needs to be cleared out of his body. But we can't be sure about that, so we're going to do the surgery and we'll find out more about that tomorrow. So here's what we ask you to pray for. Pray for no cancer. Pray for complete healing and restoration for, for uh, Jacob. And by the way, he's doing great. You know, he's here today and he's just um, looking good and um, and uh, feeling good. And so things are going in the right direction. But this next phase of chemotherapy is really, 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 really bad. And so if we don't have to do that, we definitely don't want to do that. So let's uh, let's pray in that direction. Okay. Well, let's uh, start off. We're going to start a new series of lessons today that I'm calling Grow. And there are several things the Bible talks about us growing in, and I would like to just explore those for the next few weeks. Uh, but we'll start with a story. This guy's walking down the road, and he sees a sign that says, uh, uh, Talking Dog for Sale. Well, he was interested, right? Wouldn't you be, like, Talking Dog for Sale? So he goes up, and he, he knocks on the door, and the owner of the, at the house there answers and says, You have a talking dog for sale? He goes, I do. He's tied to a tree around back. You can go back and see him if you want to. So he goes back. And he gets to the, um, to the to the dog, and he walks up, kind of you know, kind of hesitant at first, but he says, uh, "So are you a talking dog?" And he's thinking this might be some kind of a joke or something. And the dog goes, "Yeah, yeah, I'm a talking dog." Uh, I realized early on in my life that I had this gift that I could talk, and so he says, um, "You know, I, I I wanted to use that gift for something good." And so when I was uh, a little bit older, and I was you know, uh, you know practicing talking a lot, I went to the government. The government employed me through the CIA. They put me into situations where people didn't think that I could hear and talk, and and so I, I was involved in spy work and espionage, and I traveled the world. Uh, and but eventually, that jet setting kind of lifestyle just really wore me out, and I decided that I was going to do something a little more local. So I volunteered at the airport. Uh, 
You had to walk around and be near people that were having suspicious conversations. We, kept, you know, we, we apprehended lots of people doing evil things. And finally, I decided to settle down, you know, get married, have some, have some puppies and raise a family. And well, here I am now. And, and uh, so this guy says, wow, that's amazing. So he goes back around the front and uh, he goes back to the owner and he says, uh, so this dog's for sale? Uh, and he goes, yeah, this is for 10 bucks. 10 bucks is all you want for this dog? He goes, yeah. Uh, he talks, but he's a liar. He doesn't tell anything that's true. Um, <laughs> all right, so it's a silly story, but uh, as always, I always have some kind of application. There always has to be a connection between what we say and what we do, yes? Always have to be a connection between our talk and our, our walk, right? And as we're talking about what it's like for us to grow up there's a serious integrity issue in terms of our faith when what we say doesn't line up with what we practice. Does that make sense to you? And so in, in the Christian faith, there's this idea that we're supposed to grow up or mature in how we behave and in how we practice what we believe. And so this idea in the Bible is that we are to grow, to grow up. And so we're going to talk about what that means uh, today. I think one of the most important parts of growing up in the faith is that you grow up. Now, you grow up yourself. Now, now um, if anyone in your family is telling you that you need to grow up, it's because you're silly, right? You know, and you're not, you're not, that you're not behaving according to your age. I might have heard that a couple of times in, in, in recent history. Uh, but when we say to someone, "You need to grow up," what we're saying is that you need to take responsibility for you and for your actions, so that you are going to grow up and be more mature. And the very first thing that I think you need to understand about growing up in the Bible is that you have to do this. You cannot get into heaven on someone else's faith. Right? You can't live according to someone else's faith. Uh, not your spouse, not your parents, not your friends, not your church leaders, not your teachers. They can encourage you, but they, they can help you along the journey. But you have to take responsibility and accountability for your faith and maturing in your faith. Does that make sense to you? That's a starting point. You can't just look at everyone around you and say, everyone else is going to do this and help me right, uh, for me, they're going to have to do something uh, that encourages you and you're going to have to grow up on your own. Another critical factor to this growing up is also what we call a process, right? Growing up is a process. And I want you to think about that. When we have little children, uh, we don't think of our little children as fully grown. Uh, I teach parenting classes and one of the things I have to remind parents of when they're asking me questions is, your child is not a mini adult, right? They're not little miniature adults running around uh, uh, acting against what they're supposed to be doing. They haven't learned yet. They are in a process. And so we have a little granddaughter right now, and I won't spend hours talking about her, although I could and would love to. Uh, but, you know, we're watching her grow up. You know, she's maturing. She's learning new things. And she's saying new things. And she's adapting to new things. Uh, we were, uh, the other night, we were out um, outside, and I was uh, talking to Jacob and, and to Jordan. They were trying to jumpstart his truck and get it going. And while they're doing it, I said, you boys doing all right out there? Well, Riley was sitting right next to me when I said that. So she comes in the house a little bit later, and uh, she says uh, to them when they come in, says, you boys cold out there? You know, so she called, you boys, she picks up everything, right? Uh, she's growing up. She's learning. She's, she's going to eventually mature, and, and there she is now. Um, and she's going to grow up, right? But we, don't, we can't expect adult things of babies, right? There's a process in place there where people grow up and they become, right? And that takes time. And I think the same thing is, is true with us. We need to learn to grow up spiritually. We take accountability for our own growth and invest in it, and we grow up spiritually. This is in Ephesians chapter 4. If you'll turn there with me, Ephesians chapter 4. It starts a little bit earlier by talking about church uh, leadership, or as I've been saying in, in recent years, uh, church servantship. Uh, and in the, in the early church there, you had five people that were five responsibilities. You had, uh, you had uh, the um, uh, apostles, you had uh, also prophets, you had teachers, you had evangelists, and you had uh, shepherd elders, right? Those are the five groups of people, and they were uh, there to equip the saints for works of ministry, right? Their job was not to do ministry for you. Their job was to equip you to do ministry, to do service. And so... In uh, chapter 4, we're just going to pick up right after he says that. Uh, he says uh, in, verse, in verse 12, he says, For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, 
to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. In other words, what he's saying is that, that we have as a body, like he's not talking about you individually here, he's talking about us corporately, we have a responsibility as a body of believers to look at Jesus and to grow up in all aspects into him, right? To become like the one uh, who, who has now saved us, right? He's the head of the church, the head of the body of Christ. And we are to measure up to the fullness of the stature of Jesus. That is our goal. We're measuring up to that. We're, we're maturing up to that. And so he says in verse 14, as a result, we are no longer to be children uh, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, craftiness of deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to, what's the word? Grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Okay, And he goes on to say some more things. But the, the principle here is that when we're looking for the model, what we're going to grow up into, what am I going to be like when I'm grown up uh, as a Christian? Well, I'm going to be like Jesus. I'm going to be more and more like Jesus. Individually, but collectively, corporately, the body will begin to look like and function like Jesus in the world. Does that make sense to you so far? So, so just to kind of make sure we're getting it, you have a responsibility to, to grow up in your faith. Uh, it's a process. You're not going to do this overnight. You're going to grow up and mature as you go through life. Um, and as you learn and as you experience life and as you make mistakes and as you do things that are good, you're going to grow up. You're going to become more and more like Jesus individually and also collectively. We have this responsibility to, to grow up. Now, in the Bible, we see this, this idea of growth in several different ways. In fact, it's in, a, in an agricultural setting. And so imagine Jesus who's trying to teach people, and as he teaches people, he uses agricultural words like grow or reap or sow. He uses these agricultural references. So, for example, uh, Jesus would say in the Sermon from the Mountain, Matthew chapter 6, verse 28, 28, he says, For consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither, neither toil nor they spin. They're anxious about nothing, right? And he uses this reference to an agricultural reference to, to say there's something about them. They're growing, but they're not worried. And so part of what we might learn from that is that as we grow, we shouldn't be anxious, right? We shouldn't be worried about what we, what we are, what we're becoming. We should just continue on growing, trusting that God's going to make provision. In uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 30, uh, we have another reference to growth, but uh, what happens in Matthew chapter 13 is Jesus tells a story about a man that plants a field, right? And in this field, he plants good seed, right? And what they notice is after a few days is that there's some other things growing up with that good seed, some weeds that are growing among the wheat, and the, the disciples come and say, hey, what's going on here? We planted good seed, and now we see that this, these weeds are growing up. And uh, the problem is, what do you do about that? Right, And so Jesus says in the story there that an enemy did this. An enemy came in and sowed these, these evil things amongst the good things. And he says, you wait until the harvest time, let it all grow up, and then what do you do with it? Well, you separate it. Right? You separate it out and you keep the good and you throw out the bad um, that is to, to be burned. And so in uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 30, Jesus uses this idea of growth. Let it grow up. Now, I think maybe there's another lesson in there, not just collectively about a field, but about your life. What's growing in your life? Good seeds planted, but there's some bad stuff there, too, that needs to be weeded out. Um, uh, again, a little bit later in, uh, in the Gospels, in, in Luke chapter 6, Jesus makes this observation. He says that no one, after putting their hand to the plow, this is chapter uh, uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 62, uh, it says no one after putting hand to the plow and looking back is worthy for the kingdom of God. Right? You can't inherit the kingdom of God if you're always looking back and investing in the world. You look forward and you, you go forward in the manner that God calls us to go forward. Um, the idea there, though, is that we're going to reap what we sow. This agricultural thing. If you want to grow up, uh, in your faith, and you need to sow good seed. You need to make sure that you're moving in the direction and not pursuing things that are evil. So Jesus uses this language of sowing and reaping. Uh, Paul also does this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verses 10 and 11. He talks about this, and he says that the plowman sows in hope of reaping, right? Uh, the way that the thresher also uh, has this hope of reaping so they can share with others. There's this idea that we sow with an idea of reaping a harvest so that we might be able to be generous with the things that we have. So this is the uh, this is a big idea in the Bible, a little bit more in Galatians chapter 6. Uh, and actually, we'll just read this one here. Turn to Galatians, just a couple pages back from where you were in Ephesians. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, uh, at the very end of his, of his letter there, beginning... Uh, let's see, let's start here in verse 6. He says, uh, The one who has taught the word 
is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, what's going to happen? That's what he's going to reap. Um, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. If you're going to sow to the things of the world, when he talks about flesh, he's not talking about your body. He's talking about a way of thinking, the way of the world. You sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we'll we will reap if we do not grow weary. Um, so then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those of the household of faith. And so this idea of doing good and, and, and sowing and reaping, these are all, all part of this idea of growing, what it means for us to grow. Now, uh, I've taken all this time to set you up for, for understanding what we're looking at here in 2 Peter. So turn to 2 Peter with me. Um, and you really need to study the whole book of, of uh, 1 and 2 Peter, I think, to gather everything that's in here. Um, but I think that what, what Peter's after is, is, is a, an idea that, that we are supposed to continue on growing in something, right? And that something is clear at the end of the chapter. We grow in grace and we grow in the knowledge of the Son of God. That's what we grow in. That's what we're supposed to be growing in. Um, and there is a process, but there's a process that, process that lands within a context. And the context of that um, is this chapter 3. So if you go back to chapter 3 with me, we're going to read through uh, a good bit of this, beginning in verse 3. I'm going to break this down into six pieces for you. I think that maybe it helps if we just kind of break some of these things down to understand what he's trying to drive at. And so the very first thing he says in uh, chapter 3, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 3, he says, Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For what they maintain, uh, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world, uh, the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Speaking of Noah in the days of Noah and the flood. But by his word, uh, the present heavens and earth uh, are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. The first thing that he's trying to say in this chapter is that Jesus is coming. Okay, that Jesus is coming and that we should be ready for that. And that there are people who are going to come along and tell us things like, ah, he's not coming. Things keep on going on just the way they always have been. Nothing's changed. Look at the world today. It's no different than it was. In fact, it might even be worse at times than it was in the past. What are we doing here? We're just waiting for nothing, right? There's some people who are going to come along and try to raise doubts about, <laughs> about Jesus, right? about God as to whether or not they're going to come and that there will ever be a judgment, that there will ever even be any kind of destruction uh, that takes place as promised or judgment that leads to eternal life as promised. So he raises doubt. So there are people in their day and in our day that are trying to say that Jesus is not coming, that there is nothing out there for us. It's just going to keep going the way it's been going in the past. It's not going to change. Um, and so he says, that's not true. Don't lose sight of that. Jesus is going to return just as God promised. Amen? Amen. I believe that and I live by that. Now, the second thing he does is verse 8 and 9. He says, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. Take a quick point about this. What he's trying to say here is that God's timing is not our timing. Okay. Now, if you've ever been waiting for someone who's running late, it might seem like forever. Okay, uh, But that's not what he's trying to say here. He's, he's trying to say something about God and his nature that's apart from our nature and something that we find very hard to understand. And that is that God doesn't exist within time and space the way that we do. Uh, for God, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. It doesn't matter to him. God is not slow. It's just that God's not operating on our schedules. Does that make sense to you? I hope that makes sense to you. Because he goes on to say that the Lord is not slow about his promise. It might seem like that. The people that are saying these things, that God's never going to keep his promise. It's been going the way it's always been going. It's, nothing's going to change. He's not going to keep his promise. God is not slow about his promise. As some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. In other words, what God is doing is he's giving us time to be ready for him to fulfill his promise. And he's being patient with us, and he's enduring with us, and he's giving us time so that no one would have to perish. Some will, but he's giving time for everyone to come to a place of repentance. And so, 
Jesus is coming soon. God's timing is not our timing. God's ways are not our ways. Uh, and in, in the meantime, we're supposed to be faithful to him in anticipation of him keeping his promises. Now, it goes on to say this. Now, this is more about who we're supposed to be now because of what he's just said. Knowing that Jesus is coming soon, knowing that we shouldn't give up or that we shouldn't think of God as delaying or maybe God's not going to fulfill his promise. He says some more things. And this begins in verse 14. Um, he says, Therefore, and by the way, when you see therefore, that's when you know that there's an application from what he's just said. He says, therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace. This is so important. Okay, this is very, very important. Don't give up. Jesus is coming. Be found diligent and at peace with God. Now, the way that we have peace with God is through Jesus. We don't attain peace with God through what we do or how well we perform or how hard we work. Be diligent to be found at peace uh, in him. And that is in Christ Jesus to be found at peace, spotless and blameless. You don't clean yourself up. Jesus cleans you up and prepares you for his return. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, right? He says he doesn't want anyone to perish but come to repentance. What he's doing is offering time for salvation. Re regard the, the patience of God as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking uh, in, in them of these things, in which are some things that are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do not, uh, as they do also the rest of the scriptures in their own to their own destruction. Um, so he's doing, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of things here. In verse fourteen through sixteen, he's telling us here that we need to be diligent to be found in peace, to be found spotless, to be found blameless. Um, and then he's going to say there's something else that you need to do, right? Because not just be found ready, but you got to make a defense for yourself. You got to be prepared not to be overwhelmed. So in verse seventeen, he says, "You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand." Be on guard, right? Be on the defense to be on guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. And so this idea is that we've, uh, we've got this uh, diligence to be found pe uh, at peace with God in Christ, to be found spotless and blameless, to be on guard to defend ourselves against the undisciplined. Okay. Uh, or maybe the other word for that could be unruly in some translations. For people who are at work, who are not patient, who are not waiting for the Lord to return, who have given up on the idea that God will fulfill his promises. We need to be on guard against that because we can allow them to influence us in such a way that we also begin to give up hope and live as if we are not prepared for Jesus to return. So we got to be diligent. we got to be on guard. And then he gives us the grow part of this message here, which comes in the next verse. He says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, now, here we are. We're living in anticipation of God fulfilling his promises. Uh, we're being patient. God is being patient. He's offering time for repentance. This is, in, in, this is teaching us about salvation and about our own salvation, that God has been patient with us. <clears throat> we're supposed to be diligent and we're supposed to be on guard, but we're supposed to grow. We're supposed to increase in our in grace and also increase in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, this idea of growing in grace, what would that look like? Well, you're going to have to come back next week to find out what that is. I'm going to give you that next week. This is two parts of an introduction to this series. Uh, this idea of growing in grace isn't just uh, that I'm supposed to grow and to have a greater understanding of the grace that's been given to me, right? Because I do have grace given to me. Just like you, if you've been uh, baptized into Christ, you've received the grace of God, you've been saved, uh, you were dead in your sins, now you've been made alive together with God, for by grace you've been saved through faith, faith and that not of yourselves. It's a free gift of God. That's what's happened to each one of us who now are following after Jesus. Um, but I'm not supposed to become a recipient only of that grace, but a conduit of that grace. Now I'm not just receiving grace, but I'm now giving grace to the old others who are around me. And that's where I grow. I grow in my understanding of what God has done, but I also grow in giving that same grace to the people who are around me. Could we all benefit from giving more grace to the people around us? Uh, I mean, if they would behave better, we wouldn't have to give them so much, right? You know, but, uh, but the truth is that, that it's not on them, it's on us to reflect the same grace that we've been given into the lives of the people around us. 
We may talk about this next Sunday, but in Romans chapter 5, Paul talks about this in terms of grace being a place in which we stand, right? It's an ecosystem. As I have received grace, so I give grace to those who are around me. As I have understood who Jesus is, and I've modeled my life after him, so should I impact the lives of the people around me by giving Jesus to the people who are around me. Okay. And so we grow in grace, and we grow in the knowledge of Jesus. If you want to know more about grace, you've got to know more about Jesus. There's no other way around that. Jesus is the perfect expression of what grace looks like. And we'll explore more of what that means uh, as we go. Now, um, we've all got some growing up to do, don't we? It doesn't matter uh, how long you've been a Christian. It doesn't matter how long you've been following Jesus. We've all got some growing in grace to do. We've got some growing up to do. And I've discovered in, in recent months that I have a lot of growing up to do. There's still more out there for me to grow in and more for me to learn. There's always more for me to learn about Jesus. Um, several years ago, I had the uh, privilege of meeting a, a man by the name of Neil Lightfoot. Does anyone recognize that name, Neil Lightfoot? He was a professor at uh, Abilene Christian University for, I don't know, 100 years or something like that. Uh, he was an expert in ancient documents, and he had come to Ypsilanti, Michigan, right next to where we lived, and I had a chance to have, uh, have lunch with him one day, and so I met with him and we were talking. He wrote a, um, a little book on how we got the Bible. It's an excellent little book on how we got the Bible in the way that we currently have it. Uh, well, one of the things that he said to me when we were talking talking about this, uh, about, about his life and his teaching and so forth, uh, we were talking about the Gospel of John. And as we're talking about the Gospel of John, he said, Sam, I, I taught the Gospel of John for 35 years at a graduate level uh, at ACU. And he says, here's the amazing thing. Every single year that I taught it, I learned something new. Uh, and, I, and I thought about that. I said, man, I'm not even 35 years old. And this guy's been teaching my whole life, and he's still learning new things about Jesus. And I think that what that means is, but I'm never going to fully comprehend Jesus. I'm in a process of learning more and more and growing up and maturing and becoming the person that I'm called to be in Christ. And so the more I know about, the G about Jesus, the more I can grow in grace. There's a connection between those things. We've got some growing up to do, and we're all growing up to be more and more like Jesus. Now, just one final word before we end this lesson. And if you'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. There are things, and we'll explore several things, but there are things that we are supposed to grow in, right? But there's some things we're not supposed to grow as well. And one of them is we're not supposed to grow in weariness. Right? And one of the issues that's at play in 2 Peter chapter 3 is this possibility of growing weary. Like we're waiting for Jesus to return. Like I want Jesus to come back now. Don't you? Don't you want Jesus to return right now? Like as Christians, we should be not just looking forward to uh, thinking maybe Jesus will come back tomorrow. We should be looking forward to it going, I hope he comes back tomorrow. I hope he comes back today. I hope he comes back immediately and that he brings all of these things that are happening uh, to rights, that he settles everything. and We get to go and be with God forever. I'm not just hoping that will happen someday. I'm hoping that will happen today. And I want to be ready for that moment. So don't grow weary is one of the uh, one of the warnings that we have. You can grow in lots of things. You can grow in love. You can grow in grace. But never grow in weariness. Because when you do, you start listening to the people that are saying things like, I don't think Jesus is ever going to come. I don't think God's going to keep his promises. You'll never grow in grace and in knowledge if you begin to believe that God is unfaithful in keeping his promises. He is not unfaithful. And our chief example of what that looks like is still always and forever going to be Jesus. And so at the beginning of chapter 12, after he's given us this incredible view of, of heaven, like all of these witnesses gathered around, these people of faith making testimony about how God keeps his promises, <clears throat> he says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the races that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, that's you and me, right? That's the people who he loves and wants to redeem, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now listen to how he wraps this up. He says, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Do not grow weary and do not lose heart. God is faithful. 
He proved that with Jesus. And he's going to prove that again when Jesus returns. He's going to keep his promises. Let's be faithful. Let's be diligent. Let's be holy people. Let's be on guard. Let's grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. More next week. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we thank you again for your word, for your Holy Spirit that's inspired these things. Father, we ask that you would help us to not only know these things, but to live by them. Uh, that, Father, as we um, implore you to send Jesus to bring this world to its appropriate ending, Father, we look forward to that day, and we long for that day. But let us, Father, never give up and think that maybe you won't keep that promise. Help us to be faithful, to be diligent be on guard against the things that could tempt us to not believe you and not trust you and not have faith in you, that you will keep your promise. Help us, Father, in these days and in the days to come to be steadfast, to be immovable, to be abounding in, in the good work that you set before us to do in this, in this life. Help us to be faithful, knowing that the work that we do here is not, <clears throat> not useless or in vain, vain. Father, we ask that you would help us to be, uh, to be diligent, uh, to be on guard, to be people that are representing Jesus in a way that shows the grace that we have received and gives an example of the one we are following. Father, we thank you for Jesus and for his grace and for his example. Help us to copy him, Father, and to follow in his steps. Father, we ask that you build us now as we continue on in worship. <coughs> Help us, Father, to grow in all respects and to become more and more like Jesus in the days to come. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray.